Hello and welcome to another edition of The Front Page on GNAT TV. My name is Andrew McKeever, the managing editor of the Manchester Journal. It's my pleasure to be your host today. And it's also my pleasure to have with us in the studio a special guest with us. Susan Minter is a candidate for the governorship of Vermont. She's running for the Democratic Party nomination. And we're delighted to have her with us here to talk about a few of the issues uh, going on in the state. And uh, Susan, thank you very much for making the time available. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. Sue Minter was, uh, until last September, the Secretary of the State's Agency of Transportation. And before that, for four years, she served as Deputy Secretary to the Agency of Transportation. And during that time, also, uh, as many of you will remember, uh, served as the Chief Recovery Officer for the state's recovery from Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. Uh, about a six month stretch, I believe, uh, when you were overseeing the reconstruction Actually, of. Actually, 16 months. 16 months, I beg yeah. his pardon, when <laughs> overseeing reconstruction of the state's roads and bridges. Uh, and we all remember that event quite well, I'm sure. Uh, prior to that, she served for six years in the Vermont State House of Representatives, representing her home district of Waterbury and three surrounding communities. Um, she's also no stranger to the Manchester area. Some of you will remember that she was also part of a, the delegation of state officials who came to the Manchester 2020 uh, event uh, back in 2013, which was an attempt to look forward into the future and kind of project uh, what kind of community we wanted to see in Manchester and the surrounding area. So, uh, Sue, welcome back and uh, welcome to GNAT. And I guess my first question is, uh, why do you want this job? <laughs> I mean, it seems like an awful, often thankless kind of position uh, where people get to criticize you a lot if you were running the state. So what, what attracted you to throw your hat in the ring? Well, I'd have to say that the story really begins uh, with my discovery of this great state of Vermont. It really happened from the back of my father's station wagon. When I was a kid, he and my, his, me, he and my mom threw my brothers uh, and I, I'm the only girl, uh, the baby girl, three uh -huh. big brothers. But we were in the, what we called the back back of the station wagon, you know, those wagons with the wood panels. I remember. Uh, driving the eight hour drive to yeah. get to Vermont. And you know, most of the time I slept in the back, but I always <laughs> knew when I arrived and looked out the window that I would be in a place of magic. And you know, it may have been through the eyes of a child, but I always uh, think about those memories, cherished memories, and they really were the seeds for me mm -hmm. of why I wanted to live in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky to fall in love with a man who shared my passions, my husband, mm -hmm. David Goodman, um, and we decided to live in Vermont to raise our family here because of the great state that it is. Um, great schools, great community. I was very involved as a young mom. I'm a working mom with two kids who've mm -hmm. gone through uh, the public schools. One is through and one is still in. And very involved in the schools when they were kids, uh, volunteering, also a part of the early childhood program in our town. Then I became a soccer coach uh, for 13 years of youth soccer and on the planning commission until I had the opportunity to serve on in the legislature. What a privilege for six years. And then was appointed, as you said, to be deputy and then secretary of transportation and also Irene recovery officer. And mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I am really driven to serve. It mm -hmm. is public service uh, that I believe in. I believe in our state deeply and this opportunity to serve. And I really think we are at a pivotal time in our nation, but also here in Vermont. And I believe that I have the unique qualifications of serving in the legislature and the executive branch, running the second largest agency of our state, mm -hmm. uh, balancing a $600 million budget and managing a workforce of 1,300 people, a very diverse workforce. And these skills and opportunities, I think, will help me be a governor ready to go on day one to lead our state forward. Okay, well, uh, as usual, the, there's no shortage of, of issues and problems mm -hmm. that's going to be facing the next uh, chief executive of the state. Um, I mean, it seems like an annual occurrence every year when the legislature reconvenes in January that they're, they're looking at a large budget deficit, you know, shortfall financially, and, and this year is no exception. Uh, the interesting thing, though, that, that seems different this time around is that uh, one of the factors involved in that shortfall is Medicaid spending. Um, 
Last year, the governor proposed a payroll tax, 0.7%, uh, I believe, uh, that was basically dead on arrival in the legislature, it seemed like. Uh, it went nowhere, but uh, now we haven't come up with another alternative to pay for that. So I guess if that's still a problem, when, when and if you're elected uh, at the end of next year, um, what would your solution be? Would it be a payroll tax or something different? Well, I think what you're driving at is the increasing cost of our health care system. Mm -hmm. And that's really what underlies this. Um, I think it's also important to point out that uh, we do now have a very comprehensive system of access to health care. When I was in the legislature, ten, between 10 and 20 percent of people were uninsured. Um, part of what's driving the Medicaid budget challenge is that we now have 95% of our Vermonters have access to care, which is a great accomplishment. Um, but many of them are in the, the Medicaid program, more than were projected. So that is the shortfall. And it is going to be an incredibly challenging budget year. Um, I do know that uh, whatever they do this year, uh, those pressures on health care will continue. So I think it's really a question of what are we going to do about health care reform moving forward. And what's critical is to continue our work to bend the cost of care. Uh, and what is part of that is how we fund health care, uh, not just how we finance it, but what we're paying for. So right now we have a system which depends on getting more people through the doctor's office, uh, prescribing more drugs and procedures, all of which drive cost. But that's how the system of payment goes to the providers and the hospitals. And the idea is to move away from that and toward an integrated system of care that can actually focus on prevention, prevention and a integrated delivery of care to keep people uh, going back to the doctor's office or to the hospital. The other day I was visiting a program in our senior center called SASH. It's become a statewide program, which is aimed one of many important prevention programs aimed at the growing population of seniors to help provide regular wellness services to seniors at home and where they're living so they ha can stay out of going, getting sicker and going to the doctor's office and getting more medicine. Mm -hmm. It's just one small example of the way we're trying to really think differently about how we deliver care to continue health care reform to reduce cost. And that will help reduce the pressure on not just the Medicaid budget, but many other programs that are really uh, challenging our state budget. Mm. Well, a, a kind of a corollary to that would be the economy of the state in general, I guess. Uh, and, and, and it's almost like another annual rite of, of, of winter where we, we hear about, well, the economy of the state is un underperforming. And, and while the, the unemployment rate in the state numerically is fairly low, uh, there still seem to be a lot of Vermonters who are either not making enough in terms of salary or, 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 or not taking part in, in not participating in the, in the labor force. I guess I'm just wondering what ideas you have about how the economy of the state might be kind of perked up a little bit. And in particular, our region down here in southern Vermont, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, uh, a recent report about the southern Vermont economy was recently released, uh, headed up by a group of folks down here in Bennington and Wyndham counties, uh, pointing out that you know tax receipts and, and other economic indicators were lagging somewhat behind other parts of the state, particularly Chittenden County. And while Chittenden County and Bennington County are different animals altogether, uh, it was certainly interesting uh, to, to many of us down here to see that, you know, numerically speaking, we seem to be kind of, you know, uh, falling behind a little bit. So if, if you're elected governor, uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can change that around? Absolutely, and I think you're raising really the fundamental issue of our election, which is how do we continue growing our economy? And when we look at what's happened, especially since the Great Recession of 2008, and I was on the Appropriations Committee at that time, so I know how devastating it was, uh, we have actually built back, when you look at the state as a whole, this, the number of people employed in the workforce, the GDP as a whole, is come back to almost pre-recession era levels. But it is not happening equally around the state. 
to your point, precisely. If you look at the Chittenden and, and surrounding areas, we've had very significant job growth, and about 73% of the state's job gro growth has happened in that area. But when we come to the southern counties, it really has been stagnant. And this is really a critical issue for our future. It's why I am going to Bennington tomorrow to talk with the regional economic development officials and legislators to understand more from the folks who wrote that report. I'm meeting with uh, the president of Bennington College. I'm going to be back in Brattleboro. I'm spending a lot of time in these southern counties because it's critical to our future. And I want to tell you, in addition to how we want to grow jobs, I think about three things. First, I think about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned the 2020, <laughs> and we think about our roundabouts right. yeah. and uh, what a difference they have made, not just for people getting through Manchester, yeah. but actually to the viability of the community of Manchester and the economy of Manchester. It seems a small thing, but what I have seen as the Secretary of, of uh, Transportation is that investment, public sector investment into infrastructure can actually become a stimulus for, and a driver of private sector growth. And I have many examples throughout Vermont where we've done significant public investment, not just into roads, but so sewer, water, wastewater, and a new main street with a pedestrian orientation. And we've had significant private sector investment and growth. And in our downtowns, great vibrancy, community spirit and pride, and a growing grand list, manufacturing, commercial, re retail space, all growing and of course residential. So that's happening in some pockets of the state. How can we bring that vibrancy down to this part of the state and in these important regional centers? That's what I'm thinking a lot about. One of the things I'm excited about in Bennington is the fact that our agency recently, the Agency of Transportation recently uh, funded a bike path that's going to connect downtown Bennington with North Bennington and Bennington College. Things like that can actually start to bring families and vitality to a community, as well as investing in buildings in the downtown and making them hubs of new innovation, new uh, maker spaces, new shared workspaces. Things like that that are happening in um, Burlington, I think, have opportunities in the southern part as well. But two other points I want to make, and it really gets to entrepreneurship, which I've mentioned, and workforce. Mm -hmm. One of the key issues that I think statewide is that really even while we've had economic growth in some areas, we see poverty growing everywhere in our state. And when I think about the future of Vermont, I'm thinking about future Vermonters, both those coming out of high school and the future workers of the state and the employers. Right now as I've been visiting employers all around the state, especially manufacturers, they have many jobs available for Vermonters. They can't find the workers qualified to fill them. At the same time, we do not have a large enough number of Vermonters continuing education and training beyond high school. In Vermont, we do a very, very good job relative to the country, graduating kids from high school. We're the second highest high school graduation rates in the country. But when it comes to continuation after high school, we are at the bottom of the pack. We have almost 50% of our kids are not continuing on. So as you pointed out, they really are only qualified for service sector jobs, needing to have two jobs just to make ends meet. That's not the future we want for Vermonters, and it's not going to help our employers. So I see education and training beyond high school, connecting our tech centers, connecting CCV and our higher institutions of learning with the employers as very critical to the future of our economy and for Vermonters and to break the cycle of poverty. Mm. It's probably not often thought of as an economic related question, but uh, it strikes me that there's a large economic component to this next one I, I wanted to ask you about and your position on the legalization of marijuana. Um, it's been discussed that uh, could potentially bring in a certain amount of uh, tax revenue into the state coffers, which is probably would be would be nice, but I, there's a whole lot of other factors involved around that decision, which the le legislature seems poised to kind of take up uh, this coming session uh, in January. I guess what is your what is your position on that? Do you feel like that would be a step forward for the state, or, or maybe we should wait a little bit longer and think about us a little more carefully? Well, what I have decided is if the legislature passes this, I will support it. 
um, but for the governor, it's about how we implement it. And for me, there will be a high bar of implementation. And I'm concerned about three key components. How are we going to regulate and distribute uh, this marijuana? And that's very important because I believe we need to build out very slowly. We already have um, facilities that are uh, giving out dispensing marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, they clearly are educated in what is in the marijuana uh, that is being used. One of the reasons I am supportive is I'm concerned because I hear that Vermonters, especially young Vermonters, use marijuana, highest use in the country. And yet, what I'm also learning is they have better access to marijuana than they do to alcohol. And it's because it's not regulated. But also, we don't know what is in some of the marijuana. And I've heard terrible stories about marijuana laced with many things, including heroin and opiates, because some dealers are looking for greater habits to sell. So I'm thinking about how we distribute it and regulate it, but also secondarily for me, or fundamentally for me, is that it be accompanied as a mom with education and prevention programs, just like we've done for tobacco cessation, which has been successful, mm -hmm. actually. And third, as the former Secretary of Transportation, I'm quite concerned that we have a way of uh, enforcing our impaired driver laws so that we have a roadside check of whether someone is impaired with marijuana. So those are three key elements, regulation and distribution, education and prevention, and driver impairment. That's what I'm gonna be focused on if this passes and I'm in the job of implementing it cautiously and carefully. Okay, well, uh, another question probably related to that is the whole uh, issue of surrounding heroin and opiates. Um, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, it, it's just seems like it's uh, ravaging the state in terms of uh, not just uh, the addiction problems that it causes, but also in terms of crime and, and uh, burglaries and, and, and what have you. Uh, you know, it seems like there's a real lack of um, easy access f to treatment for folks who decide they, they need to kind of uh, break out of that cycle of addiction. And I guess I just wondered if, if uh, beyond what Governor Shumlin has already been talking about and, and deserves credit for, I think, uh, for bringing the subject, you know, kind of front and center during his uh, State of the State address a year ago, uh, what, uh, what do you think the state should be doing uh, to uh, interrupt what, what is going on on the heroin front? Well, I have to tell you that this is one of the top priorities. It is one of the top challenges that is ravaging our state. It's affecting every aspect from our schools, even our early education. I hear from teachers and parents about kids uh, having uh, needles in their book bags and come to find out that the parent of that child was putting the needles into the book bag so that she wouldn't use while her child was in school. I'm hearing about it from teachers and social workers. It's over uh, uh, impacting our criminal justice system. Um, and of course, our healthcare providers. I've been to two opiate treatment centers to understand uh, from those providing care uh, how it works and whether it's being successful and what more we need. I want to point out to um, uh, one of the great models that I'm actually wanting to learn more about and have been introduced to, which is in Rutland, and it's called Project Vision. And this is an incredible um, commitment that the city, and not just the city officials, but the community of Rutland City have really uh, focused on improving their uh, community through a very uh, inter, inter dependent um, and interagency uh, perspective. So I visited the police station, which is now uh, co-located through Project Vision, not just enforcement officials, but uh, folks dealing with domestic and family abuse, folks dealing with corrections, a very uh, folks dealing with mental illness challenges, a broad array of service providers working as a team because they know who in the community they need to keep watch on. And they're working together, collaborating together. And alongside of that is a community driven group of faith leaders, nonprofit organizations, citizens, very concerned. So we have a community pulling together with this very strong focus on treatment and making their city safer and keeping 
folks uh, from making bad choices. It's a very complex situation and it's a very quickly escalating problem. Now, you mentioned about treatment and we do have a hub and spoke uh, treatment system around the state that is very quickly getting up and running. Uh, it's trying to keep up with the escalating problem. Uh, we have to continue that and we have to look also and perhaps even more importantly at prescribing habits because sadly that's where it begins. It begins in many instances when people are coming out of the hospital with some kind of a pain, the medication and the over medication that they're getting uh, to treat that pain. So I know doctors are beginning to really collaborate on what are the right and wrong prescribing habits and then how to not allow patients go from doctor to doctor to continue to get those kind of medicines. So it's a very complex mm -hmm. and very high priority and a very serious one that we must continue to yeah. build on. Yeah, um, yeah indeed. Um, let me just shift gears slightly uh, while we have a little more time because I think this next one you'll probably want to have a little time to answer uh, comprehensively. And uh, obviously a big uh, a major piece of legislation that the uh, that passed uh, through the state house last year was Act 46, uh, the the whole the bill to uh, consolidate or simplify or overhaul the governance of whatever the right term would be, of uh, the state's educational uh, system, school districts, supervisory unions, and what whatnot. It's been very controversial, as I'm sure you know. Uh, there's some some school districts seem to be kind of uh, really wishing that this, they didn't really have to go through this. Uh, Finding, finding merger partners and, and uh, districts that, were, that are compatible has been challenging for some districts, uh, although the process does seem to be now uh, moving forward. I guess, uh, are you a supporter of Act 46? Uh, do you feel like uh, that's heading us in the right direction? Or if you had been governor, would you have been advocating for something different back last spring? Mm -hmm. I think Act 46 is moving us in the right direction. And I support the goals, which are quality, equity, and efficiency. And I think we have to come to terms with the fact that student enrollment is declining precipitously and will continue to decline. And that the number of facilities, buildings, and schools that we have are, cannot be uh, afforded in the same way as they are today. So it is a future looking bill. I do have significant chat problems. I'm opposed to the caps that were provided, the variable spending mm -hmm. limits, which I think are going to have a very detrimental effect on many schools and communities and the quality of the schools, particularly at a time when we're trying to have what are very difficult conversations about the future. And so I think they are detrimental and undermining the very goals of Act 46 that I support. I also think uh, that the timeline is very uh, is too tight, and so many s districts are moving to try to get the tax incentives. For some communities, they've been having these discussions for a long time, and it makes sense. But for others, they're very new discussions, and you need a lot of data that the Agency of Education doesn't always have able to provide uh, when communities need it to make difficult decisions. So I hope we can spread out the timeline, uh, eliminate these ta the, the caps, but continue forward with these discussions. And let me tell you why. Now it's clear as I go all around the state what a privilege it is really to actually see the different parts. And I was just at Burr and Burton Academy and what an incredible school that is. Um, and the districts are very different and the challenges are very unique to each part of the state. In my district of the Harwood Union High School in Waterbury, um, we have a wonderful school system um, we do have seven different boards and seven different budgets, all serving about 2,500 students. Now, I think that it makes sense for us, I hope, to what I consider not consolidate, but regionalize, to look regionally with one budget, one lens about how we can best utilize the assets of all of the schools. In some cases, we have two middle schools a couple miles from one another, and we're competing for teachers because we have different school contracts, uh, different teacher contracts, different salaries offered. And all of this, I think, we need to think about regionally. Now, there are some places where schools are becoming simply so small that you can't afford to keep them open with the declining population. I think this could be an opportunity to think differently about some of those 
school buildings. How can we sustain them? Yes, as an educational resource, perhaps for a smaller student body, let's say K or pre-K through third grade, but also think about using them for other community needs, like a multi-generational facility. We know seniors need uh, places to go in the middle of the day. We know seniors could go to a healthcare screening uh, community resource. There are many different community needs that could possibly be utilized by a school with a declining enrollment, which doesn't mean give up the building, give up this wonderful piece of our community that we cherish and believe in, but think differently about the future because the needs of our community are changing with our aging demographic. Um, and there are needs out there, community needs that could be funded uh, with other sources so that it isn't all on the property tax. Um, these are the kinds of kin conversations we have to have and I know Vermonters uh, are good at rolling up their sleeves and being able to think differently. I don't think they should be penalized. I think they should be encouraged to think differently and enabled to think differently. Um, and these are not easy conversations, but I believe they do have to happen. Mm. Well, it's certainly going to be an interesting conversation to follow as we go forward. And uh, uh, down here, uh, we have a couple of merger study committees now underway. And uh, as you say, it's, um, I think the hope is that that will we'll, that we'll lead it at some point to uh, some kind of relief on the property tax side, because I, I think really, you know, that's going to be a kind of an important measuring rod if it does succeed in, in kind of either, you know, making the, the districts operate more efficiently and saving money. and and what have you, but. Uh, and I think that is absolutely part of the goal, which yeah. is, I mean, I hear it far and wide, the escalation of the property tax is really a challenge for many families. And mm -hmm. we've got to try to think differently about how we fund our schools and how we govern them in order to, yes, reduce costs, but not at the ever, at the expense of the great education that we want to give our kids and do here in Vermont. Okay, well, I, I think there's a lot more questions we could probably discuss, but uh, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. And I, I uh, want to thank you again for making the time to come down and talk with us and share your views with us and, uh, um, and help inform the, the, the viewers to see if they think, hmm, maybe we'll want to cast a ballot in that direction come, uh, come the primary. And thank all of you for watching as well. This has been the front page on GNAT TV. My name is Andrew McKeever. It's been a pleasure being with you today, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks again for watching.